city, I've been browsing. Treading water that they drown. My head on a swivel. Yeah. It's only really my surroundings. Hello and welcome to episode 170 of the Smash Accept podcast. Actually, it's episode 21 of the Smasher Pass. But I'm your host, Michael Royer. You can find me on Twitter at Dynasty Dad FF. We got a great show planned for tonight. Really going to talk about running backs. Who better to do that than two of my favorite guys? We're going to mix both Smash Accept and Smasher Pass with the the All Stars here. Mung, how you doing tonight? You know, you got some some big news. We're going to chop up on your man Saquon Barkley. You got to be thrilled with that news, right? Yeah, I was super high on Saquon barking, uh, bouncing back, excuse me, not barking back uh, from his <laughs> injury last season. And, you know, all systems are go. He's healthy. And the, the potential holdout was the only question mark this offseason. And now that that seems to have been dealt with, uh, I love it. You know, Daniel Jones is a mobile quarterback, but he's one of the few who actually does check down to his running back quite a bit. And that's what we love about Barkley's pass catching upside and He's still pretty young. It feels like he's been in the league for a while now, but yeah, absolutely moving Saquon Barkley way up in redraft and he's been up in dynasty all along and he stays there as well. Yeah. Normally we're like, Hey, let's start with the pleasantries, but we got running backs. I mean, we got to jump into that because you guys want us to dissect that completely. You know, Saquon Barkley signs the contract. We didn't change him much in, in the Patreon in our rankings. And we're going to talk about some trades that some of our guys were able to, you know, capitalize on. But Snoog, I have him as my Dynasty RB7, my redraft RB7. Saquon Barkley gets this one-year $11 million deal where he gets the $2 million signing bonus. So a happy Saquon is an absolute beast. Just how high is the ceiling for him this year? RB1 overall. And I actually put a thread out about that. And I think both of you guys saw that. I was talking among a little bit about it, but. He can do it all. He's one of the best running backs I've ever watched since I since growing up. He's like he should have been the best running back of all time. That's how talented he is. Coming out of Penn State, he was a flawless prospect, but in that system, he's going to be one of the go-to guys in the passing game again. He caught 50 passes last year. That was honestly his floor. He's had 80 plus in his rookie year. He finishes the RB2 as his rookie too, so this guy has an incredible ceiling. Finally, more than two years removed from that ACL injury. So he finished RB5 last year, proving that that ACL didn't matter. He was explosive, rushing for over 1,300 yards. I think he can do that all again and build off what he did last year. He's my redraft RB3 and my dynasty RB6 right now. So I'm glad you said greatest of all time. This is the Walter Payton would have been 70 years old today. Mung, who's the greatest running back that you've ever seen? You know, in my lifetime, it's pretty easy. But I mean, who's that guy for you? I mean, as a Chicago, and I don't think I can say anyone else other than Walter Payton, at least uh, not unless I want, you know, a lynch mob on my doorstep, right? <laughs> I think, you know, growing up in the 90s for me, it's Barry Sanders, just watching what he could do. You know, it's just, it's a different type of running back, you know, like there was just, I grew up in the fantasy generation where Ladanian Tomlinson was so exciting to watch, you know, and Adrian Peterson, and it's just, it, it made a different variation for that, you know, and I, I know that, you know, Snoog's a huge Kamara guy and just fantasy football is like the running back position is what we absolutely love. Right. I mean, quarterbacks are fun. Wide receivers are fun. Running backs. We absolutely love them. But Snoog, the NFL executives are not saying that. Right. We have a major trend here, obviously, with with some some issues about running backs not getting paid. But I think that translates into how we look at him in Dynasty right now. I mean, right, we are in a spot now where the wide receivers just keep moving further and further up. Running backs keep moving down. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think it's becoming a issue now where teams aren't really valuing their running backs, especially some of these higher end quality guys like Saquon, Josh Jacobs, all these guys. But look what the Philadelphia Eagles did last year. Your Eagles themselves, you I'm sure you watched every single game. They were the best rushing team in the NFL by a mile. There's a reason to that. And that's what a good reason why they had so much success in the play action game. Because the run game just gets everything established and it gets sets the tone early to be able to play smash mouth football. So we've seen teams like the Titans just absolutely dominate doing the run heavy offense with Derrick Henry They're They've been like a mediocre team for so long now, and they've just made the playoffs every year because Derrick Henry rushes for like 200 yards a game. But I think that the NFL is going to come around on it and realize that guys like Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, Bijan Robinson, all these guys are just guys are going to have to pay and guys that you took, 
top 12 overall, like Jameer Gibbs and Bijan Robinson, don't take a running back that high if you're not going to pay them. That's a bad process by you if you think you're only going to get four or five years out of the player and then it's see you later. You know what I mean? So yep. if you're drafting these generational running back prospects, you're going to have to pay them. CMC, Alvin Kamara, they've proved to dominate after getting paid. Alvin Kamara finishes the RB1 overall, getting very – damn near close to 2,000 all-purpose yards in 2020, having like 20-something touchdowns. So he proved that, pay me and I'll produce for you guys. So I think that the NFL is going to need to figure that out and start paying their running backs. Not every running back should get a big contract, but the guys that deserve it, like Saquon, he, he proved last year that he's still him, his old self. And despite all the injuries, and that's probably why the Giants were a little eh about it, but he's a big part of their offense and he carried them last year for sure. Yeah, and Mung, I mean, it's trickled down a little bit to Josh Jacobs is a little bit sour right now. They, the rumors are that he's moving, you know, leaving Las Vegas, which I'm going to be going there in two weeks. So, you know, maybe he'll be back by that point. Uh, you know, but then it's a matter of even now you see Jonathan Taylor's a little dis- disgruntled about contract situations. So, I mean, how serious should we be looking at it? We know the wide receivers are getting paid. We know the the idea of the holdout isn't quite as strong for those guys because the elite wide receivers are getting played. Now our elite running backs seem to be – you know, like, hey, when's it my turn? It's a tough situation because from the NFL team and organization standpoint, you understand it, right? Because they get used up quickly. They're the most prone to injury because of mm-hmm. the punishment that they take. But at the same time, from the player and a person standpoint, you know, these guys have to be able to provide for their families given the risk that they put their bodies through on mm-hmm. any given play. And I tweeted this out when all this was going on and Austin Eckler was tweeting about it and all the running backs were chiming in. And I don't know what the right answer is. I've heard interesting responses where we can maybe shorten the length or the duration of their rookie contracts or do rookie contracts positionally. That opens a whole different can of worms Um, from a salary standpoint, having more guaranteed money for running backs. I'm not sure what the right answer is, but Really, they need to figure it out, and we should all have a little bit more empathy, right? Because at the end of the day, I, I tweeted out that we're all replaceable, right? Chat GPT, AI, that's going to change the landscape of a lot of different career paths, and who knows what else in the future. But this is a sport that we love to watch, and even if maybe the analytics say that the quarterbacks and the passing game and the elite wide receivers deserve far for much more money, they still need to be taken care of somehow, and uh, hopefully the NFL and the NFLPA will figure something out over the next couple of years because this is only going to be an issue that continues progressing, right? Because as more and more kids start playing football at the youth leagues uh, into college, what happens if people just don't want to play the running back position? And I don't know. We'll find out. I mean, that's a great point. You know, you go to baseball, everybody wants to be the wide receiver. When I was growing up as a kid, everybody wanted to be the quarterback or the running back. You know, and now it's a lot of guys are really talking about your longevity for your career is better. You know, your your the way you're getting paid is going to be better. But, you know, we're not a, a find that's not the, the premises of Smash Except. You know, what we want to talk about, we want to talk about some Saquon Barkley trades, you know. So in our in our Patreon, uh, FFB Russ said he cashed in on Saquon Barkley for Alexander Madison. Pat Fryermuth, the 110, and Sky Moore. Mung, I mean, no, that's four pieces on that side. And you guys are both really big on Saquon Barkley. This is a 10 or 12 team, one quarterback, 0.5 PPR, no tight end premium. So Pat, Pat Fryermuth drops down a little bit. You got Madison Moore in the 110. How's this sit with you for Saquon Barkley? I mean, I think we were we were really advocating going out there and buying Saquon Barkley on the cheap. We're going to go over some trades that I'm finding on Bulletproof. But I wanted to first cover the guys that are in the Patreon right now. Yeah, I don't love it. On on paper, it's not terrible because you're getting about three for its first worth of value. But I have questions and concerns about Madison. We haven't really seen him step up into that every down role and how efficient he'll be when he gets more touches than in a change of pace role. And then Friar Muth, I like, but I don't see him ever cracking that elite mm-hmm. tier of tight ends. I think he's a fine back end tight end one. He's going to see a lot of volume probably more touchdowns than he had last year, assuming Pickett can take a step forward. But at the end of the day, none of these are really game-changing, true league-winning pieces outside of Barkley. So I probably would have kept him there. He, he did. He got Barkley for that. That's what, oh, the one we yeah. advocated there. Oh, you know, like, I love it. <laughs> you look at it a lot of times, right? Like, 
yes, Saquon Barkley is probably worth like 2.5 first, depending on or two first plus. But uh, you look at Moore and Madison, the values aren't 100% locked in. You know, it's, And in a one quarterback league, that 110 is a lot different than than what it is in a super flex. So not bad there. Um, <laughs> my man, Nick Fleming, just went, he was like, hey, if Saquon's going to be out there, I'm going to make some offers. He made 10 offers across his league. Uh, two of them got accepted. Snoog, the first one is, uh, J.K. Dobbins and Terry McLaurin or Saquon Barkley and t- and uh, Tyler Lockett? That one's interesting, but I think I'm still going to just go with Saquon because I just think I, I like the potential in Dobbins this year in that Ravens offense. It's going to be so electric, and he has double-digit touchdown potential, but he it seems like he's already injured again. Something's going on. He's on the pup starting off the year, so I'm not sure that needs 100% as much as we'd like it to be. And for me to move off a running back that I believe has RB1 overall upside, and if I'm a serious contender, I'm just going to lean with Saquon. I think I think I need more guaranteed pieces to move off of Saquon in a scenario like that. And Nick's other trade, start 10, I think he just said, hey, I love Mung, let's do this. It's Tony Pollard and JSN or Saquon and Hollywood Brown. Yeah, I would smash Barkley and Brown in, the, in that trade. I, I love it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm looking at right now on Bulletproof, and there were some trades that went down to me, even for a 24 first. You see Dotson and Pacheco for Saquon Barkley. Kenny Pickett in the 25 first for Barkley in a 25 second. You know, Damian Pierce in a 25, a 24 second for Barkley. It's like, man, you guys were selling cheap, you know. Uh, Michael Pittman and Antonio Gibson for Saquon Barkley. It's like that window has closed. If you guys cashed in on that and you listen to us, Congratulations. You know, you guys are going to love that because Saquon is going to beast this year. Um, I want to do a little bit of fun here. You know, where, like we talked about the guys in the Patreon sent in. We're going to do a little bit of smash or pass. You know, Mung's are super familiar with that. This is what we do with, with myself and Snoog. So the guys sent in the questions and they want to know what your takes are. So we're going to start with you on this one, Mung. Uh, without Kareem Hunt, we're looking at Nick Chubb's projection, smash or pass, as the RB2 overall in 0.5 PPR? I, I don't hate it, but I'll pass. Just from everything the Browns have been saying about wanting to revolve the offense around Deshaun Watson, and even though Hunt's gone, we've just never seen uh, excuse me, Chubb get a ton of work in the passing game. I think he's had one season where he's had more than 30 catches in a year and that just concerns me a little bit now does that mean he can't do it absolutely not he's probably the best pure runner in the league but we know that receiving usage is so so important in fantasy production so i'm gonna lean past here yeah i know the interesting thing is when i was on fantasy pros today they have him as their rb2 you know he's right behind christian mccaffrey you know you look at what he was able to do last year and he was fantastic at times you know he finished as the rb6 with 1500 yards snoop chubb's a guy that you've been buying everywhere we're, we're talking about a, a full ppr I, I would have i would have some quarrels there at half point ppr or standard you know is nick chubb the rb2 are you smashing or passing on that for 2023 it's tough i think i'm kind of where mung is with that two might be a little too high but i definitely would have them top five probably closer mm-hmm. to like that f- three four five ish range i don't think i could have him over christian mccaffrey or or saquon barkley just because of the crazy upside they have in the run game and in the pass game but honestly like putting chubb three like i would not mind that at all i would i'm fine putting him over austin eckler that's for sure and i think right now he's a steal at rb 13 in dynasty if you are building yourself into an area where you are trying to win now nick chubb you know i mean some of the trades i'm seeing right now for people trying to cash out on nick chubb are, are ridiculous rashad white and michael mayer random 24 first sky Moore in a 24 first for nick chubb i mean i think nick chubb has the chops right i mean we look at the age and everybody's like okay you, you seem like he's been in the league forever but he's 27 years old he is going to be an RB1 this year, no matter what. You know, I'm with you guys. I think he's in that top five to eight range. And I think for what you can get him for in dynasty value, Nick Chubb's always been an undervalued guy because of that that PPR, you know, narrative. And if he gets a couple of catches here and there, you know, that's straight money just adding to the bank. The next one on here, and this one's tailored towards you again, Mung. And, uh, you know, I'm not making it totally Mung-centric, but we got our guy, the Miami Dolphins shakedown. So we're looking at, from the Patreon, we wanted to know, 
is Devin A. Chain a top 24 running back this year? Or will Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson factor in enough that either of them top out for carries? So I'm interested to hear. I mean, I know you love Devin A. Chain, um, but I want to I want to hear your takes on this. And this one was was sent in from uh, that's from A Bomb Diggity. That's tough. I just pulled up my redraft rankings and I have a chain exactly at RB24 right now. Yeah, and fantasy um, pros has them at 29. So I think 24 is a fair assessment. I mean, you know, you, you have to look at it. What Raheem Moser is going to get the one and two down work, but we've been talking about this for months where if a chain gets the third down and a lot more PPR upside in there, ball in space, it's definitely in the realm of possibilities. Right. And, and a lot of the ways that my redraft rankings are composed is I want guys who can be decent flex options, but with weak winning upside. Right. Mm -hmm. And none of us are projecting a chain for a ton of volume. But in that Mike McDaniel system where he does scheme his playmakers into space, I think that a chain can bust a 50 yard touchdown or more any given game, even on five to seven touches. And if he gets 10 to 10 to 12, 10 to 15, then, yeah, I, I think he can finish as a top 24 running back this year. I take that back. Di Fantasy Pros has him as their RB29 for Dynasty. For redraft, they have him as his RB46. So if you guys have have anybody, I mean, you're looking at guys in that area above him, Jeff Wilson, Tyler Algier, Charbonnet, Elijah Mitchell, Samaje Ryan, Damian Harris. I just can't see it. Jamal Williams, you know, he belongs up there more than that. James Cook, Javante Williams, Alvin Kamara, like even just thinking in that area if he gets his – his shot. Snoog, I mean, we haven't talked Miami very often. You know, Mung and I have quite a bit. How do you see this shaking out? I mean, I have people asking me all the time, should I give a fourth round pick for Jeff Wilson? Should I try to get Raheem Mostert thrown in? You know, is it going to be one of those big guys of Zeke and Fournette on the outside or Cook coming in? You know, what do you see ultimately happening here in Miami? And is A-Chain someone that, you know, I've had him above Kendra Miller. I've gone back and forth. I know you've loved him. But just where do you have him for, you know, 2023 running backs? Yeah, so right now he's I, – I put him back and forth between my RB4 and 5 between him and Charbonnet. It's just tough. I think he's in a lot more clearer path of an offense in Miami than Charbonnet is in Seattle. He's not going to be playing alongside another very talented running back for the next three, four years of his rookie contract. He's playing with the skeleton of Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert. So I think Achain, with his speed in that offense and that – elite yak electric offense that Miami produces. And I think it could be great. And Tua, Tua likes to throw the ball to the running backs. And Mike Daniels is going to get Achain out in space. So I really do think that Achain will have himself a role eventually. I'm not sure what his role is going to be. And that's what's interesting because he's a good pass catcher and he's lightning fast. But he's not that big of a guy and it doesn't seem that he can carry the ball 25 times a game because he's 5'9", like 190. So... Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how he kind of pans out, but I could see him having like a JD McKissick, James White type career arc where he's just an elite pass catcher. And he's also a really good pure runner, although he's smaller. So he can make some damage on like 12 to 15 touches a game in Miami. Yeah, and we're looking at like a Tony Pollard light. Mung, I I'm seeing some trades here that are just going to blow your mind. I mean, today on Sleeper, someone traded Gabe Davis for Devin A. Chain, a 25 second straight up. We have one here where uh, he gave up Wandale Robinson for Devin A. Chain. It's just like I can't see any of those scenarios where that makes any sense. I mean, no one is in Miami. We've been talking about it with Dalvin Cook forever. But the Dalvin Cook, you know, rumors are pot potential suspension. You know, Miami doesn't want to pay up. And there could be a scenario here where they roll with Mostert as the RB1 and A. Chain gets, you know, that those 10 to 12 touches. And he's going to instantly pay off in Dynasty when you make those kind of moves. Right, and we've touched on it before, so we don't need to talk too much about A-Chain today, but really everybody sees the lack of size, and that's what's so scary, right? But if he had landed anywhere else, that would definitely concern me more. And, and yes. really it's just the fact that defenses have to play back. They cannot, cannot press up on Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, And that's just going to give them so much room underneath. And they didn't really have that last year. They didn't have any guys – other than Mike Gusecki, who got a few targets here and there. And I know Raheem Mostert's fast, but he's not quite the dynamic receiver that A-Chain can be. So I really do think he's going to open up a lot of opportunities for A-Chain in this Miami offense 
which is in the mold of Kyle Shanahan's scheme to really get a chain up on those wheel routes, uh, maybe even line them up in the slot here and there. And I, I think the ceiling is just sky high. I like it. See, speaking of sky high ceilings, and we talked about it last week when we had Kluge on great episode. If you guys haven't checked it, where we did our nuclear takes, you know, we talked about DeAndre Hopkins and then really into our, a fun episode of our hot takes, you know, Snoog, you, you probably haven't caught up on that one yet, but we were talking about DeAndre Hopkins and what that does for Derrick Henry. I mean, a lot of people have really soured on Derrick Henry about what he's able to do. I mean, coming off another 1500 yard rushing season, smash or pass, Derrick Henry getting back to that 1,500 yards again for Houston. I mean, you got to like DeAndre Hopkins going there, stretches the field a little bit more. How high are you on Derrick Henry, and are you going to smash this? Yeah, I actually really like Derrick Henry for redraft this year. I know the age is a concern, and there's never been a Derrick Henry, but there's also never been a Derrick Henry that at age 29 was – I think he hit 1,500 last year, right? Correct. So this is a guy – they hit 1,500 yards in an offense led by like Malik Willis and all these crazy guys while well, Ryan Tannehill was out. No Traylon Burks. That offense was horrible. So I truly believe Derrick Henry can be a 1,500-yard guy again. DeAndre Hopkins, like you said, stretches the field open. You got Chig. You got Traylon Burks healthy. Ryan Tannehill healthy. I think Derrick Henry is going to be a smash in 2023. Uh, Mung, we talk about it all the time. There's a lot of people right now, like, if you're not a contender about selling Derrick Henry, I mean, obviously, this is your last window. We said that last year, but I mean, it literally, this is your last window. And I think, you know, the days of getting a first round pick, you might be able to get that early on in the season. I've seen very few where you can get a 24 first, but I'm seeing some trades that I really like, you know, like, uh, Jordan Love and Derrick Henry to get to a tag of Aloha in a 12 team super flex, like using Derrick Henry as capital to do a two for one, you know, like a, a move there where you are taking, you know, the, the depreciating asset of Derrick Henry, you know, there's another one here, Derrick Henry and JK Dobbins for Brees Hall. You know, you like, you make some of those moves where you add Derrick Henry to someone else and move yourself into a better position. Yeah. And I, I man, it, it's so hard to bet against Derrick Henry because he is the outlier of outliers. Right. And you don't want to bet on outliers. But when you've seen someone like him do it year after year after year outside of mm -hmm. the one season where he missed a lot of time, it's just so hard to bet against him. But I am fading him slightly. Uh, you know, 29 years old. That's not a threshold that we'd like to see for running backs who that have true elite ceilings. And then the other concern is receiving again. He had career highs in targets and receptions last year, and they just had no other options. So while I do think adding Henry in the return of a healthy Burks does open up the run game a little bit more, my concern is that he's going to see less target share than he did last year. Again, career highs in 2022. And then the addition of Tajay Spears as well. Remember, Dontrell Hilliard got hurt last year. So they really used Henry in a way that we didn't really see prior to 2022. And I do think that could decline a little once again in 2023. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the narrative of him falling or, or breaking down is, is ridiculous. When you look at he was number two in, in yards after contact, only behind Josh Jacobs, number one in, in uh, broken tackles with 35. And you look at just 4.4 yards per carry at a guy at 29 years old. For me, I'm selling if I'm in that bottom five. You know, but if I'm trying to move into that area where I'm in the middle, I feel like I'm trying to move because we get into an area where Derrick Henry gets injured, that value is going to plummet hard. So if you're on a rebuilding team, now is the time to make sure we're moving that off. Uh, trade sent in from our guy. Uh, we got Fleece by Chass. Here's our smasher pass for you, uh, Snook. Aaron Jones has the best year of his career and finishes as a top 10 running back this year. I could see that. I'd smash that because you got Jordan Love coming in for a sure quarterback. He's going to want to make things easy. Aaron Jones is a great receiving back. Um, we've seen him do great in the past few years catching the ball from Aaron Rodgers, so there's no reason why he can't catch dump offs from Jordan Love as well. They're probably going to lean on that run game heavy too. First year starting quarterback. They don't have the best wide receivers in the league. They're decent. Christian Watson, we got to see what he's made of, see if he can build off last year. And be like that true bona fide number one guy consistently getting open and moving the chains. But as of right now, they got nobody like that. So Aaron Jones is going to be that guy for them. And I could see AJ Dillon as well, kind of eating on the ground game. So both of those running backs are smashes. I like it a lot. Mung, Isaiah Pacheco, can he run away with the KC workload 
and be a top 15 running back in 2023? I'll pass on that one. I, I like Pacheco a lot. I liked him a lot last year, and I think he's going to be the lead back, quote unquote. But at the same time, we saw that he was playing through various injuries all the way through the Super Bowl. And Kansas City is a team that year after year, their goal is the Super Bowl. This isn't a team that's just trying to get to the playoffs, right? So they want to conserve their backs most likely. I do think they'll mix in McKinnon. They'll mix in CEH, maybe even Daenerys Prince, the new guy. At the end of the day, I, I just think this is going to remain a committee. And I think Pacheco probably has the most upside week to week. But it's tough to see that kind of level of production in what I do think is going to remain a committee. What are you willing to pay for him? I mean, if you look at what he was able to do at 4.9 yards per carry, um, you know, 830 yards, and you look, he, I mean, he did not start until midway through the season. You know, they were kind of working things through. Jarek McKinnon was still getting his, and he's he's going to be that red zone guy for them. I mean, what would you be willing to pay right now if you're a contender? I mean, you talk about if you're trying to buy some of these other guys, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. But an Isaiah Pacheco, I would much rather have than say a Brian Robinson. What are you willing to pay to get his services? I think early second is about right, maybe a late first, because once again, he is a great runner. He's going to get some red zone touches, but at the end of the day, Travis Kelsey's that number one red zone guy for them. And we know that Patrick Mahomes can throw any target anywhere, especially near the goal line. He'll scramble around a little bit, find one of their five or six wide receivers who can all share those targets. And yeah, I, I would bet the under on like, 10 touchdowns for Pacheco as much yeah. as I love. And I would say the going market right now probably is, I mean, he's going right now in round, round 10. Uh, Snoog, and I love these kind of shows because we don't talk about these guys a lot. You know, we talk about the sexy guys, the Garrett Wilsons, the this and that. I mean, Isaiah Pacheco, you got, you own him on your team and I come to you for a mid 24 second. Is that a smash or pass? I'm keeping Pacheco because I just think, the upside in that Chiefs offense, he could be a double-digit touchdown scorer running the ball, and mm -hmm. who knows? He he was pretty solid last year. I think what he gave last year was worth about a second if you need like an RB3, RB4-ish to compete, mm -hmm. so why not do it again? Doesn't seem like Clyde can put it together, and McKinnon's the guy on third down, but Pacheco's a good receiving back as well. I mean, coming out, I know a lot of the post-trading camp hype stuff, you're not supposed to follow it, but he was doing a lot of Tyree Kill esque looking stuff back in last year's summer camp, and I remember everyone was like, "That's just because he was number ten. Yeah, yeah that like, looks like Tyreek. Yeah, it looks like the fake number ten. But I think yeah. Pacheco's all right. He doesn't blow me away, but he's got some speed and he's in a great offense, one of the best, if not the best. So why not smash him for a mid second? All right. Now I know I know Mung's take on this one, but we're gonna talk. Brees Hall has had his injuries. He's obviously, we're, we're looking at him coming off the ACL, going to be starting out on the pup list. You know, and a lot of you guys are like panic selling. Don't do that. Like the way the new pup list is, he can come off of that at any point here. But there is some, some you know, a little bit of room for concern. Snoop, Javante Williams is not going to start out on the pup list. And the difference right now is the 206 to the 508 in a dynasty startup. Okay, so here's my smasher pass for you. Javante Williams, by the end of training camp, will be a early fourth round startup pick. Smasher pass. That's a smash. I think he's around what right now? Like 508. Maybe? He's yeah, RB15. And I think in that area, he would have to be going about RB10. Uh, I. I don't know. I don't know if I can get myself to put him over the RBs that are above him currently, I think. I don't think you can put him over Pollard, Jacobs. The question I keep getting from people right now, because we're talking about the injuries, is Brees Hall or Javante Williams in a mid-24 first? Brees Hall and Javante? Or no, Brees, Brees Hall. Paul, or Monte in, Monte the in the 24 first. We talk about it. You know, we, we we have such a hard time tearing up. And we talked about our podcast. If you guys didn't catch that two pods ago, Snoop mm -hmm. and I just crushed it about how you tear up. And Brees Hall was one of those guys we're willing to tear up on. But, I mean, you know, we talk about it. Similar injury history, similar, uh, you know, upside here in that area. And I'm, you know, we're going to be doing a podcast later this week talking about the 24 class. And I'm starting to go through that. And those top seven in that class, man, is like, whoo. Like, you don't yeah. want to miss out on that class. 
Um, I'm going to go with Brees Hall because he's my dynasty RB2, and I don't think Javante Williams is on the same stratosphere as Brees Hall as a talent. Um, Brees Hall was one of the best running backs in the NFL in his first eight weeks, and now they got Aaron Rodgers. That offense is going to be a million times better, and he's going to probably score 15 touchdowns on his next fully healthy season, probably going to be in 2024, but He's a guy that can catch 60 to 70 balls because he's a phenomenal receiver. He was an elite athlete coming out of Iowa State, and he's going to be a guy that can take the ball 280 times up the gut and make tons of plays. So he's my RB2 in Dynasty right now, so I'll, I'll use that to tear up all day. Yeah, no, I'm definitely all for buying the dip. I'm going to pull up some trades here on both of those. But Mung, I mean, Javante Williams hasn't been a guy that you've been in on the past, but now we're talking about, you know, he's avoiding the pup list. We talk about an offense with Sean Payton where he wants to get these guys much more involved. So what are you doing with, with Javante Williams at this point? Are you using him similar to Derrick Henry? You know, I know we talk about running backs a lot. Like you believe in a certain guy or I believe in a certain guy, but ultimately, you know, we're not trying to trade off just for peanuts. We're trying to use as much value as possible to those guys to move to players that we enjoy more. Right. I'm rooting for both of them, right? I, you always want to see players come back strong from injury. And I hope Javante can do that because he was great in flashes, but at the same time, even avoiding the preseason pup list, I still think that they really want to use Samaje Pirine in a committee alongside Javante Williams here. We know what Sean Payton has done with Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara in the past, and I envision something similar and potentially with Pirine taking that all-important receiving work, right? That's partially why Joe Mixon's upside was capped last year, even though Mixon did still see a lot of work as a receiver. And I think it's great if Javante is ready for week one, I don't know if he's going to be fully 100% effective just because he's on the field week one. So I think it's fine if you want to invest in Javante Williams. Personally, I'm still not to the point that I'm paying a 2024 first for him. And I would rather pay, you can probably get Piran still for what, a late second, maybe a third in some leagues. Third, and I'd rather, take, I'd rather take the cheaper Denver running back at this point still. Yeah, and I'm okay trading what will be a 9 to 12 range. I don't want to trade too much that's up there above it on the 8 side. We were talking about buying the dip on Brees Hall. I mean, Snoog, some of these trades I'm seeing right now, like Ramondre Stevenson in a second. I see Chris Olave even up, and I'm okay with that if you want to get you know want to get healthy, and I believe in Chris Olave. Deontay Johnson in a late 24 first. Uh, <laughs> Damian Pierce to 201 and Terry McLaurin. Like, those are the kind of deals. Absolute smash, except guys, go out there. And kick the tires on the Brees Hall owner. They might be worried about what's going on. I mean, have one here, Najee Harris and Keenan Allen for Brees Hall. I love Najee Harris, but that's not that's not a trade you should be making. You know, like this is an elite level talent. Brees Hall for the one nine and the one eleven. You're not getting a player like Brees Hall at the one nine and eleven at this class. You know, uh, Najee Harris and Sam Howell. Um, you know, like these are George Pickens, Alexander Madison, and Matthew Stafford. That's like I just threw up and threw play three players I don't want. And got Brees Hall. Like these, these moves can be had. Like go, go out there, kick the tires on the Brees Hall owner because people don't understand the pup list like they used to. It is different. You know, it does not mean he's going to be out till week seven. You know, this is a situation where he could he could start week one. Now we're going to have a nice little segment here, a little bit of a, a fun, a little bit of a keep trade cut, you know, or um, a little bit of a variation of that where ours is going to be stash smash cash. So just so we clarify it here. The keep is the stash, the trade is the smash, and the cut is the cash, all right? We always mess that one up, but we're going to give you guys three names in a similar bracket right now, and we're going to we're gonna break this down. I mean, I hope we can get to a bunch of these here. Let's start out. We already talked about Brees Hall. Let's go Brees Hall, Jameer Gibbs, Travis Etienne, Snoog. I'm going to play with your heartstrings because those are your three favorite running backs other than Alvin Kamara. So you're going to have to cut one of them. I'm sorry, but let's hear what you got. I'm cashing Travis Etienne, so that's who I'm cutting. You heard it here, guys. We made him cut Travis Etienne. I love it. As much as that stinks. And then you said the trade, was, Hall. trade yep. is the smash. Trade is smash, and and the uh, keep is stash. So I'm stashing Jameer Gibbs, and um, trade. yeah, I'm going to trade Brees Hall, keep Brees Hall, smash him. 
I, I got I got no no quarrels with that at all. That's right my RB two and, and three in dynasty right the, there. The kids. only scenario I've been saying with people that are trying to get rid of Brees Hall is like go buy go buy Gibbs plus if you can. That's the only scenario where I feel like you know unless you really start to to move back a little bit. Um, Mung, this is another one that Snoog and I we talk about these three guys all the time. But Ramondre Stevenson, Tony Pollard, Najee Harris. Remember one more time to reiterate: keep is the stash. Trade is the smash, cut is the cash. So what are we doing here? Ramondre, Tony Pollard, Najee Harris. Uh, I'll stash Pollard. I'll smash Ramondre Stevenson. And I'll cash um, Najee Harris. That's a tough one, right? Like all three of those guys, I feel like they're going in that late fourth to early fifth. I think all three of them have, you know – they're, in my opinion, all three of them are going to be RB1s in 2023. Uh, Snoog, any any debate on that one? Because I feel like that one is just really kind of kind of chalk. We all love Pollard. You know, Ramondre Stevens is going to smash this year. Najee Harris is too, but I think Najee Harris has the arguably the least amount of upside with that. Is that, is that favorable for you? It's tough because I think Najee is the only one that's guaranteed a ton of volume. But I think the Patriots and the Cowboys offenses are just going to be so much more efficient than Steelers. The Steelers' line has just been so bad, but they did make some upgrades there. So that could change this year. But Najee's just a volume hog. So it could get interesting there for the redraft perspective. And it's going to be, t- it's gonna be touchdowns, right? That's yeah. what it is for Najee is touchdowns and receptions. I mean, yeah. you know, the work was clearly there last year, there was no data about a debate about that at all i mean all three of these guys right now pollard is rb8 on fantasy pros Najee harris is 12 and ramondre is 11 yeah. um just just because i want to play with with snoog's heartstrings again i'm gonna let you do the next one again monk we're going alexander madison damian pierce and miles sanders so this is that weird area right like i know we, you, you had your hot take last week of uh you know damian pierce isn't going to be what who do we have? Damian Harris over Damian Pierce. You know, Damian Pierce right now is the RB twenty one. Alexander Madison's the RB twenty two, and our third one there, Miles Sanders, is coming in at the RB eighteen. So the, the highest from Fantasy Pros out of the three. So what are we doing with these three? It's tough. I don't really love any of them to be honest with you, but I guess I'll I'll smash Pierce because he has a good market. And, yeah, he has uh, the best. I, I know that he'll sell, and you know people are paying first for him in certain leagues. I will stash Sanders because I do think the Panthers' offensive line and their defense is a bit underrated. So we could see some ground and pound. Even though I don't believe that Sanders is going to be that three-down back that's been discussed at certain points this offseason. Mm-hmm. And then I will. Uh, what was it? Um, smash cash. And, and cash. And cash. I'll cash Madison just because I'm not necessarily a believer here. Hey, this is one that we've done in the past, and, and people seem to enjoy it. We just always struggle with which ones are which, right? We're like, which which one should we go with here? What's going to be in that area? Uh, Snoog, we're going to hit the rookie running backs here, and it's Charbonnet, Kendra Miller, and Devin A. Chain. Oof, okay. Um, I'm going to cash. Let's go with cash and Devin A. Chain just because Zach Shar. I'll live up to it. Zach Charbonnet was drafted, third running back in the draft, second round pick. He's going to have some type of role in Seattle with tons of upside if Kenneth Walker goes down. I am going to smash Kendra Miller, and I'm going to what's the other what's the other one? <laughs> it's it's uh oh man, you're, smash, you guys are messing cash. me up. Smash yeah. cash or in cash. So Cash then, is the cut. Yeah. Should we go to straight keep trade cut to help you guys out? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm cutting. That's, I keep thinking keep trade cut in my head. Yeah. I'm cutting out chain. I'm smashing Kendra right. Miller. And I'm trading. I like it. Exactly. I like it. Right on, right on. Um, Mung, I got a question for you because, you know, I'm, I'm doing a rebuild. Um, I've been, been doing a ton of content on rebuilds lately, and I have a team where, you know, I got Kenneth Walker really cheap. I gave up Aaron Jones and – uh, I think Juju Smith-Schuster or something along those lines. And now I have Kenneth Walker and Charbonnet because Charbonnet fell to like 205, right? So I'm in this weird situation because I'm rebuilding. I have two running backs from the same team, you know, and I like to try to move those guys off there. But then I started kicking the tires with the guy that has a lave. And I was like, hey, I'll trade you both of these guys in a second. And it's like, 
when they're together, people don't value it the same way because they're, they're closer, right? Like we used to say, yo, if I want Dalvin Cook off your team, I need Madison too, right? But now we're in a weird situation where both of these guys have an interesting amount of value. Do you understand what I'm trying to say is it's like, you're not going to, if you're trading them as a package, you're not going to get the same value. But then on the flip side, you're waiting till one of the other ones gets hurt or breaks out. And then if one of them gets hurt, then the other one's value depresses. So it's like, it's a tricky catch 22 if you're not using these guys. So let's talk about them from a competitive standpoint and from a rebuilding standpoint, because so many people are trying to sell these guys for peanuts and they're both talented running backs. Well, it's counterintuitive because if you are trading both together, you're really relinquishing any upside of them, right? Whereas if, for, for instance, say Walker has an ankle sprain week one, and then all of a sudden you can sell Charbonnet for probably a first, maybe a first and a second next year, something along those lines. And then maybe Walker's back in a few weeks and then Charbonnet tweaks a hamstring or something. And then all of a sudden, right, it's kind of like a ping pong back and forth of value depending on, and we know dynasty gyms are fickle in season, right? As soon as somebody tweaks a hamstring or as soon as somebody scores three touchdowns in a game, their values will change drastically depending on the league and depending on the, the GM. So I think the better option is really to trade them on their own, unless mm-hmm. you have a trade partner who really does want both of them. Because again, we want that upside and the potential for these guys to grow in value. And if you're trading both away in one deal, you're really losing out on that. I think Kenneth Walker just like, I, as much as I love him as a running back, Snoop, he's still going off board as the RB9. I did. I was helping a guy with a draft from the Patreon. And if you guys want that, we do offer draft assistance. We kind of help people pick by pick. But, you know, I was shocked. We were sitting there on the board, and the guy took Kenneth Walker over Kyle Pitts in, in tight end premium. And I'm just like, what is going on? You know, like, where? Do, at what point then do you have to stretch to get Charbonnet? Like, we've looked at that in the past. When you wanted Dalvin, Madison was the sweetener, right? But but Charbonnet's too good. He's not a sweetener. He's someone who was drafted with with good capital, and it's just an interesting situation. Yeah, RB nine's way too sweet for me. I mean, if he and Charbonnet's RB twenty four, so they're both valued as top twenty four backs. And you, yeah. when you take Charbonnet at RB twenty four, you're passing on Pacheco, you're passing on Aaron Jones, you're passing on James Cook. You know, Kendra Miller. Like, it's an interesting area. Like, we haven't seen something like this for a long time. Yeah, I think people will come around on their senses real fast when one of those running backs is getting 65 to 70% of snaps. I think it's going to be like that. I think I think we're going to see a lot more Walker than Charbonnet on the field because he fits that offense more, of just that explosive running, big playmaking. Zach Charbonnet is not even close to the same playmaker or explosive runner that Kenneth Walker is. Yeah, he can get you two yards, but that is only good for certain scenarios. Kenneth yeah. Walker, they're going to put him put him in on first down. They're going to give him that probably that second down work as well. And they'll probably throw in Charbonnet as that third down guy. But it's not even like Charbonnet is some crazy good versatile receiver. He caught swing routes at UCLA. So it's like – He's too close to Kenneth Walker. We yeah. wanted, De- we wanted yeah. A-Chain to go there or something like that. Yeah, I mean, Exactly. In Dynasty, RB9 and RB24 is too close together. In redraft, again, looking at Fantasy Pros, RB15 for Walker, RB41 on for Charbonnet. So, guys, I mean, these rookie running backs, your Charbonnet, uh, you know, Bigsby, Spears, like those are the guys you want to make sure you're, you're loading up on the back half of your, you know, rookie drafts. Now that we've done Scott Fishbowl, that was one that I was trying to do everywhere. So we are back to Snoog, and we're talking rookie ran, running back handcuffs. There's a bit of a war here. These guys that go in that mid-second round of your rookie draft, believe it or not, some people are still doing rookie drafts. So if you have to choose here, I mean, and we'll go back to keep trade cut. We'll just make it easier. We, you know, we, we always do this. But Bigsby, Roshan Johnson, or Tajay Spears. So who are we keeping out of that group? I'm going to keep Roshan. I'm going to trade Tank Bigsby, and I'm going to cut Tajay Spears because Roshan has no Travis Etienne in front of him. I know. I think Tank Bigsby's right there as a talent as Roshan is, but – who knows if Roshan didn't have Bijan Robinson, the running back that just got drafted eighth overall, playing in front of him, and if he wasn't a QB when he first came in to Texas and then still mm-hmm. runs for 700 yards as a true freshman, he could be getting a lot more hype right now. He's great. He's patient. He's strong. 
he gives me cheap, cheaper Zach Charbonnet vibes. So it's like, and he's playing behind Khalil Herbert and Dante Foreman. So it's like, mm-hmm. that's not serious competition. Yeah. I mean, Herbert. I he passes there, Foreman but, pretty quick. I think Herbert's going to start out the guy. I love, yeah. I love me some Herbert, but yeah. Roshan has that clear path. Yeah, exactly. He has the clearest path to opportunity. So why not go with him? And then Bigsby's just a high end handcuff that'll get some work in on the ground game as well alongside DTN. So. This will be interesting because Mung, I mean, I'm, I'm not 100% on board the same way. And I feel like this is that area where we're like, all right, is it Bigsby? Is it Roshan? Is it Spears? Who do you like? I think I'm actually the complete opposite here. Um, I would keep Bigsby. I think Doug Peterson is going to run a committee of sorts. And I think Bigsby has standalone flex value um, with potential touchdown opportunity as soon as week one, depending on what kind of role they settle into. Um, I would trade Roshan. No, wait, let me, let me think about this in terms of actual value. I think Bigsby has the most hype. So, even, the most though, value. so yes. even though I like him, I would trade him because he is getting a lot of hype. I would keep Spears because it seems like nobody likes Spears. Um, but again, he's behind the 29-year-old Derrick Henry. And a, a lot has been made of the arthritis in his knee. But from everything I've read from actual medical professionals on Twitter and other sites, that affects his long-term potential, whereas short-term, I do think he's going to get some sort of passing down role, and he has handcuff upside. And then I would cut Roshan because I think a lot has been made that he's a great pass protector. He could immediately play on third downs. I'm just not sure what that means for fantasy because they like Herbert in that early down role. Foreman could see some goal line usage. And then it's great that you're getting, we want receiving work and and passing down plays and snaps from our running backs in fantasy, but you're going to be on third downs with Justin Fields, who can break off a 90 yard run on a scramble, who doesn't check down to the running backs a ton. So I'm just not seeing a ton of opportunity for Roshan Johnson. I'm with you on that one. I think I'm 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 probably I'm probably trading Tank Bigsby, even though he's my favorite right now because he has the clear most value. Spears, I feel like people just I mean, like we want to believe that Derrick Henry, and we were already talking about it, that he's going to be that bell cow like he always is. But I mean, there is a time where he breaks down, and we've seen Hassan Haskins and some other guys fill in and still have some some decent you know PPR upside. So I think Spears is kind of a a nice cheap role. I think all three of them are ultimately really too cheap in dynasty and you can get those guys thrown in. Uh Mung, we're going to go with you on this one. This is the handcuff version. Samaj P Ryan and Handcuff Plus. I don't want to like say these guys can't start. Samaj P Ryan, Damian Harris and Tyler Algier. Ooh, um I would trade P Ryan because again, he's getting the most hype right now, right? A lot of people do like P Ryan even though his value is still low in some leagues. I would keep Harris because I think he has quite a bit bit of upside. Uh, I talked about him on the last show. You guys can go back and listen to that. I think he has a ton of touchdown upside in that goal line role in an efficient Bills offense. And then I I like Algier a lot. He has a ton of upside if anything were to happen to Bijan, but at the same time, I'm not going to bet against a healthy Bijan. And while Algier may still get some change of pace work, I, I just don't see them benching Bijan very often to spell him when he's a young workhorse ready to go. So I will cut out you. If you know, I love Bijan Robinson too. I mean, a hot take I had was he's the RB one overall, you know, this year. Uh, Mung, I mean, th- Tyler Algiers instantly becomes maybe a top five handcuff. You know, like this is a true handcuff a la like 1990s, right? It's not an insurance running back like we're talking about where Tajay Spears is going to get some work or Tank Beasley is going to get some work. I mean, Tyler Algiers is going to be on the back seat, but we saw him rush for over a thousand yards last year. And I'm seeing trades 24 third for Tyler Algier. One guy said, hey, I'm a Saquon order, so, uh, owner. So I traded Algier straight up for Eric Gray. I see a guy here. He's uh, Isaiah Likely in a third for Tyler Algiers. I'm like, I like buying him at that spot because he's that perfect insurance running back that we've seen what he can do, right? He's, he's a rock solid RB two that, you know, he's nothing special, but he's going to run for, you know, four, 4.5 yards per carry. And he's going to be that guy on what we expect to be a pretty good offense. Yeah. I think all of these guys are definitely worth, you know, in that late second, early third range, depending on who's available there. Um, Damon Harris, late second, 
Tajay Spears, late second. I mean, all these guys I like. Uh, obviously, if you have to pick, it gets a little tougher because we don't have unlimited second round rookie round rookie picks, right? Yeah. Unless you were in a startup and you just grabbed all of them somehow. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I think Algier is being slept on a little bit. It's just it's so hard to bet against a healthy Bijan. That, that's the only thing. He's young and he's shown that he can hold up to that massive workload. Yeah. Yep. And I think these are the guys that we get thrown in deals to try to make them work. We were talking about guys that are forgetting. I mean, Snoog, this is the ugly question, but I mean, if you got to keep trading cut, I mean, I got this question all the time, Zeke Fournette and Kareem Hunt. I mean, we're going to play keep trade cut, but I want you to tell me who's going to sign a contract. I mean, there is not a zero chance that Zeke does not come back to the Cowboys that, you know, for, I, I didn't throw Dalvin Cook in there, but you could throw him in there. There's there's an opportunity where Fournette's already been in in New England, and I think, you know, that's a, a guy that still going to show up in there. Kareem Hunt seems to be a little bit like no one's really interested at all, like he's on the back burner. And Dalvin Cook, now we're hearing some ideas of maybe suspension. So Zeke, Fournette, and Hunt first, keep trade or cut. And then whoever we keep, I'm going to play Dalvin or that guy. So go ahead. Okay, so I'm definitely going to cut Fournette. I think he's Ooh, okay. easily the worst one. But it's tough because, yeah, like you said, he, it's looking like he's going to sign somewhere. So I'm, I'm going to cut Hunt because I don't – there's not a lot of buzz around Hunt. Hunt seems like he was super slow in his last year or two in Cleveland. It's like he lost a step. He's just not really the same Kareem Hunt we remember. I'm actually going to keep um, Zeke and I'm going to trade Fournette. Okay. So if you're keeping Zeke, I mean, obviously Dalvin Cook over over Zeke at this yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Mung, yeah. A a- any difference there? I mean, I feel like Zeke looked like he had the most juice there. I mean, I think Zeke is someone – I've had two or three questions. People are like, Dad, you paying a 24 third for Zeke? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a dart throw, but, I mean, there is a potential chance that he goes somewhere, someone gets injured, and, I mean, he's talented enough that he's got enough in the tank where he could put up an RB2 season. Yeah, similar, I would keep Zeke because I think he has the most hate where people just think he's completely washed. And sure, he's not as efficient as he once was, but I think he can still be in a complimentary role, especially with the rumors that maybe he just goes back to Dallas if he swallows his pride and Mm -hmm. takes a cheaper deal, right? Which is probably the best case scenario behind a, a pretty good offensive line. And again, with a coaching staff that knows how best to use him and not give him too much. Uh, but I would actually cut Hunt. I don't know that he was super efficient last year either. And I think there's a reason that he hasn't been signed yet. And people like Fournette because of what he did with Brady, catching a ton of passes. But I'm not sure that's going to be his role wherever he signs this offseason. I think he goes back to more of that traditional pounder role. Uh, goal line which is valuable for fantasy and i think he actually has a little bit of hype as well so i would just flip-flop those two and then keep zeke i like it very much so the next thing since we're getting short on the show here is we just wanted to outline three roster stashes that are outside the top 50 running backs for fantasy pros right now uh the three that i have and we can have some similar ones here and that's not a problem at all is i have jalen warren Jerome Ford, those are guys that I have been absolutely pounding the table for, making sure they're loaded up there. And Kenny Gainwell. So I think there is a good chance by the end of the season, DeAndre Swift and Rashad Penny have been made of paper mache, that Kenny Gainwell looked great in the playoffs. And this is someone that I'm getting thrown in on deals everywhere because I think there is an outside chance that he has the most fantasy points for this team as the most trusted player on that on that roster from the running back position. So go out there and get Kenny Gainwell, get Jalen Warren thrown in, get your own forward, especially Jalen Warren. If you're that Najee owner. And even if you aren't, you get these guys. I mean, a lot of people come to me all the time and they're like, okay, you know what? I'm going to sell Derrick Henry for a 24 first. Okay, that's fine. Get Jalen Warren throw in. Why? I don't want him. If Najee Harris goes down, you have another opportunity to sell something for a second round pick, you know? Um, we got to talk about it a little bit from the rebuild side is you don't want to have a ton of these guys in that area because of the potential points possible. But if you're in that middle of the pack, you want those guys. They're lottery tickets. Mung, three guys in that top 50 area, right outside the top 50 that you're interested in. Yeah, I, I like Gainwell and Ford as well. In fact, I think I have a ton of exposure to Ford on underdog right now in best ball. Uh, so I certainly like him quite a lot. I even wrote about him um, with how high people were on Kareem Hunt as the handcuff in Cleveland. But for some reason, Jerome Ford 
just because he doesn't have the same name value is being valued quite a bit less in both best ball and in dynasty. Uh, I would add on Pierre Strong. I like him quite a bit. And there was a report recently, I believe, that the Patriots are going to give him and Kevin Harris a shot to uh, get that 1B role alongside Ramondre Stevenson before they make any decisions on signing any of those veteran running backs we talked about floating around still. And then I like Ty J. Spears a lot, too. We talked about him already earlier this show, and I think he belongs in that same range as well. I like it. Snoog, you got, got a couple new guys on there? Yeah, so I'm going to go with Devin Singletary. I like that. Guy that he's just a good pass catcher. He's coming in. Damian Pierce showed he really is in a good pass catcher. So I think Singletary is going to have a role and has tons of upside if Pierce goes down. Another one I have is Isaiah Spiller. Austin nice. Eckler, 28 years old. That's an elite offense. The running It's so running back friendly. So if there's any sort of Austin Eckler injury or if they're trying to keep Eckler fresh, Spiller, if he can develop into that two down grinder, even he's a good pass catcher as well, but he's a good grinder between the tackles like he was at AM. So if he can kind of develop into that, still only 21 years old, he's another great high end handcuff. And then the third one, I will have to say, hmm, I'll go with Clyde Edwards Hilaire. First round pick, contract year. Why not, right? cheap as can be he's probably like in the rb 55 to like 60 something range yep. and he's got something to prove this is his career right now this year if he doesn't compete for that spot he's probably not going to get picked up again by another team so this is a guy that can pass catch well he actually started off really hot last year he was scoring a ton of touchdowns he was like the rb7 from like the first like six seven weeks so if he can just stay healthy and put it all together maybe this one last time he can find himself a a good role and maybe take the job from Pacheco. So those are my three, three RBs yeah. after the top 50. I had one Clyde Edwards Alaire share left and I traded it with a 25 second for Khalil Herbert. It was just like, it's time. Oh, you know, we, we, we got, we, we got to share, we, you know, we got to shed it off there yeah. real quick outside the top 70. So Spiller was one, actually he's at 69. Now he was at 70 earlier in the day. So he was going to be one of mine, but I feel like it's cheating now. I'm going to go with Chase Brown, who I think, you know, ultimately could be that second or third guy next man up, you know, behind Joe Mixon. Zach Moss, who I've mentioned before, because something's going to happen in Indianapolis, you know, especially with, with the idea of Jonathan Taylor starting out on the pup list. Uh, and then you get into some weird areas. I mean, there's guys like Jordan Mason. Uh, I like Dwayne McBride. I like James Robinson. And Mung, I kind of like Israel Abanaconda. But what's going to happen here with the Jets? Like, who is that guy? Zonovan Knight played really well. Michael Carter, you know, was played well in the early part of the season. Abanaconda, they, you know, addressed with some draft capital, which is ultimately, I think, between the three of those guys, the reason they're not going to sign Dalvin Cook. You know, I think they're really just kicking the tires on Dalvin Cook to crank the price up for Miami. But who are we taking out of that? Like, that that's the hardest thing for me right now is trying to assess who's that real guy to back up, and is it any of them? I don't think you should overspend on any of them because you kind of answered your own question, right? Just by asking the question, we saw Zadav and Knight play well. We saw Michael Carter play well in burst, but they also spent the draft capital on Bonaconda. If I had to pick one, you know, excluding cost, I would pick a Bonaconda because of the speed. I think he just caught a really long touchdown pass from Rodgers in training camp. So I think week to week, he just has that big play upside. But really, I would take whoever's cheapest, which is probably Michael Carter. I think people still remember Knight. Uh, he had a few good games towards the end of last year. I wouldn't pay much for any of them because I do think it would devolve into a very messy committee if Brees Hall isn't ready week one or if he were to re-injure himself. Knock on wood, that doesn't happen uh, at some point this season. So, again, I, I'm just kind of avoiding all those guys, but I'll, I'll take cheap dart throws on them uh, at the right at the right cost. Who are your dart throws here in this 70 to, to 100 range now? Yeah, you mentioned him. I've talked about him a little bit on previous shows. Jordan Mason, where I just don't believe in Eli Mitchell staying healthy, even if something were to happen to McCaffrey. And uh, Mason was super, super efficient as a runner uh, last preseason. Didn't get a ton of work once they traded for McCaffrey and had Mitchell back healthy last year. But I think he has a ton of upside, and he actually has the pass-catching chops as well uh, over Mitchell. So I actually really like him. I have quite a bit of 
exposure to him on, in best ball. And then uh, I actually like a rookie who hasn't been talked about almost at, at all. I mean, people talk about Zach Evans here and there. I almost never hear the name Sean Tucker mentioned. And people seem to love Rashad White, but I don't think that he's going to be all of a sudden some kind of workhorse for the Buccaneers. And I do think that Tucker could carve out a role, even if we're not super excited about it, that offense in general. Nothing exciting about this range here, but it's also like that next man up. These are the guys you got to think about having, especially when we talk about these guys. I hope they're, they're in year one, year two, so I can throw them on my taxi squad, right? It's nice having these you know, lottery insurance running backs on your taxi squad rather than your wide receiver 19 who, you you know, has fifth round draft capital. Snoog, are there three more guys that you can name off this area that you like without getting upset to your stomach? Yeah, my favorite one is Gus Edwards. Yes. Me, me and Zolte talked about it on his pod earlier, and it's just... Oh, you're, you're cheating, man. He's all the way up at 52. Is he? But I, lo- I love... Yeah, yeah, he, he's moved up considerably. Wow. Yeah. I was just looking at keep trade cut. That's why I knew it was RB75. That's why. Wow. I no, it's... Um, got up with it then. That's, that's awesome. Him, like if he- oh, sorry. Him... Um, and I really like Chris Rodriguez for the Redskins just because, or the Commanders, because I don't think there's anybody there. I, I'm not a big Brian Robinson fan at all. And it seems like they want to use Gibson in that like dual threat role. So if C-Rod can kind of get that, if Brian Robinson gets injured or anything happens to Brian Robinson, if he's, n- he's just super inefficient again, and C-Rod can kind of fill in as that two down grinder role. He could have some value added there. Otherwise, it's just a handcuff to what Brian Robinson's role would be. But Gus, the Ravens offense is going to be electric, like I said earlier on in this pod. And J.K. Dobbins' injury is just still lingering, it seems. Last year, I love J.K. Dobbins. He's on that contract year. I really want him to have a great year this year because he's a phenomenal pure rusher. But he's on the pup again to start the year. And he seemed like he lost a step. I'm sure both of you guys watched TV last year. Him breaking out a big run right up the gut and then he's slowing down like he's like it's snoog out there and pads trying to run away from marshawn Lattimore. so it was getting a little crazy with dobbins and his burst it seems like he lost a step so hopefully he can take this off season to get better and kind of not focus on the recovery aspect but focus on getting better as a football player but gus is a monster like this guy could score 10 plus touchdowns all day in the starting role in baltimore and he's Mm -hmm. as cheap as dirt you could go send out a fourth round rookie pick and probably get him so that's a guy i'm gonna go and try to acquire in every single league once we finish this podcast yeah startups i've been getting them in round like 20 21 so guys this was fun chopping it up talking running backs we all know we love that position so thank you so much guys for tuning in and enjoy the process